I want to take 120 seconds today and just review the first eight of the sons of Jacob. Do you think I can do that? I think I can. Here's the first one, Levi. Uh, by the way, the sons of Jacob, remember Abraham had, now this doesn't count in my 120 seconds. Abraham had two sons. Isaac had two sons. Jacob had 12 sons. Why the explosion in the generations? Because it took 12 sons in order to possess what God had for them in the land. Two could not do it. Six could not do it, but 12 could. And so in that, in that way, Jacob's generation exploded. It became 12 sons, but those sons became fathers. They became husbands. They were men of God, but they also became tribes, and those tribes were the ones that possessed what God had for them. So we understand that the tribes of Jacob and the sons of Jacob are really the key of life, what they represent, help us to live life and to do it successfully and to do it in an overcoming way. So Levi was the first one, and he's a great one because he represents the Word of God. And what did we discover about Levi? Levi is spread out throughout all the tribes because God said, I want everybody to honor Levi. I want everybody to get close to Levi. I want everybody to know about Levi because Levi is a picture of the Word of God. But unfortunately, the Word does not work in our life if we do not exalt it. You have to exalt the Word. Everything in the Spirit must be exalted. Jesus could not exalt Himself. God had to do that. God cannot exalt Himself. He has the, the, the people around the throne and the, and the beasts around the throne that exalt Him. Anything in the Spirit that exalts itself is a wrong spirit. So Jesus had to be exalted. The Word has to be exalted. It will not exalt itself. I spent too much time on that one. All right. Naphtali is the wrestler. Naphtali, he is the prevailing wrestler. Naphtali takes on things and wrestles and discovers that in the struggle and in the wrestle, God is doing something awesome in my life, that there is purpose and meaning behind the struggle and behind the wrestling. Then came Issachar, the seer. He's the one who understands the seasons and the signs. He's the one who understands and interprets life correctly. He's the one that says, this is what God means. This is what is happening. He's the one who sees and understands. Oh, you got to have some Issachar. Je Zebulun is the connector. He is the one who highlights the power of relationship in our life and, and the understanding of relationship. And you remember, the greatest tests in your life will always come through the avenue of relationship. If you want to know what's inside of you, watch what happens with relationships. Zebulun, the connector. Asher, the overcomer. Asher, you know what you, you got to love about Asher? As his days are, so shall his strength be. Remember, God's creator of all the days. There are no days the devil created. The devil hasn't made one day. God's made them all. Therefore, you can't have a day from hell. You can't have a day from hell. <laughs> Last time I preached that, the next day I had a day from hell. I don't know. <laughs> it sure seemed like it anyway. I kept saying, God, you're kidding, right? <laughs> But Asher's the one that understands no matter what kind of day, whether it's a day of separation or emptiness or darkness or attack or whatever it is, every day in God ends what? Good. And God said it's good. Right? Oh, I, I, I got to have some Asher. Reuben, now you don't want any of this. Reuben was the first one who dishonored his father. He fell from his prominent place. He was the one who chose to dishonor because of multiple allegiances in his life, multiple altars. Pastor Buddy, what are altars? Altars are things that have my full attention. Anything that has my full attention that is not according to God, it becomes an altar. It becomes a multiple altar. Multiple allegiances. Uh, in, in the days of Israel, they went up into the high places. They were getting high on things other than God. If you're getting high on something other than God, it is going to destroy you. Okay. Dan was not the first. He was the least. He's the little guy. Dan's the one who judges. He judges things correctly. He, uh, he judges difficult situations and understands what God is doing. He judges dangerous situations, understand what God is doing. He uh, judges the damaging things. In fact, we discovered that it was Dan who understands that just because hurt is in my life, it doesn't mean it has to hurt. That's a good thing. Jesus got hurt on the cross. He came to his disciples and said, hey, stick your finger in there. Why? I got hurt, but it doesn't hurt. Just because you go through hurts doesn't mean they have to hurt. Jesus said, nothing shall by any means hurt you. I think I'm over my 120. Gad, the attacker, he attacks what's attacking him. Gad's the one that takes on the negative cycles, the negative seasons, the negative patterns and says, enough is enough. I don't have to live this way. He's the lion-faced warriors that say, no more, enough. Hey, I did it. 
Here's number nine, Simeon. Now, what are we going to say about Simeon? Well, just remember this. Something that we perhaps have forgotten in American Christianity is that the Word of God is not just His wisdom. It is also His warning. Paul said, I'm teaching every man and warning every man. Those go together. In much of evangelical Christianity today, there is all wisdom and very little or no warning. This man will change that today. Let's read about Simeon. Genesis 29, Leah became pregnant again and had another son. She named this son Simeon. She said, the Lord has heard that I am not loved, so he gave me this son. Simeon means the one who hears, the one who has hearing, the one who has ears to hear. And just like Simeon, all the sons of Jacob had names that were tied to their identity and their destiny. God puts names on us so that it facilitates who we are and where we are to go. And unfortunately, this son and another son of Jacob never fulfilled their potential and their destiny. It's a very sad thing. But it is true. Not every son lived out his God-intended, God-ordained destiny. Some of them lost the very thing that God had intended for them to possess. You say, Pastor Buddy, why does that happen? Well, let me give you about two or three reasons why I believe that happens. And this is for free. This is all in the introduction. You don't have to pay any extra for this. I'm just going to give it to you, all right? The first one is called the sins of the father. Do you know that what one generation does impacts the next generation? The acts, behavior, uh, choices, decisions, determinations, and experiences of one generation are visited on the next generation. That's what God says. And because of that, things that happen in one generation can produce fruit in the next generation, especially in a negative way. Let me give you an example of that. My grandmother on my mother's side, my maternal grandmother, uh, when she was a little girl, she watched her father mistreat her brother. And her brother was her only brother and also her younger brother. And so she watched him routinely mistreat this boy. So this daughter then becomes a wife and a mother. So when she becomes a wife and a mother, she has already made a judgment against her father. She has already judged parenting. So when she becomes a parent, she now refuses to allow her husband to discipline her boys. So she has six sons and three daughters. The daughters came out much better than the sons because the sons never received from their father the imprint of their blessing and destiny and potential. They never got the affirmation. Because if you don't have discipline in your life, the message is, I am not loved. The way we show love to our children, one of the primary ways is we bring order and correction and discipline into life. Whom the Lord loves, He chastens. So they didn't have that. So these sons then became husbands and fathers. But they lacked the character development. They lacked emotional and psychological development. They lacked confidence. They lacked the grace that God intended from one generation to put on the next. And as a result of that, those boys never did well. They did not raise up another generation after them. The sins of the father. Secondly... Oh, I'm, no applause for that one. All right, let's try this one. The sins of the mother. We'll try this one. Simeon was raised in a household that was a self-centered, self-absorbed household. Because Leah used her children to get what she wanted. Remember Reuben with the mandrakes? Here, maybe my, the reason why she did that is because she always felt second best. She felt like she was always in second place, having to compete for the love of her husband. Rachel getting all of the love, Leah getting none of the love. So she uses her children 
in a selfish way to get what she feels she needs and wants. Well, that set up an atmosphere in the home that was very self-centered and self-absorbed. So the sons then pick up on that, and they then become the product of their home, which is now self-absorbed and self-centered. This is what happened to Simeon. Simeon became a very self-centered son. And a, a third one I'll just give you is the sins of the flesh. Because you see, you can't blame everything on the other generation. Because regardless of what's coming through the generations, you and I still have choices. You and I still have our own grace. You and I have our own behavior, our own choices, our own determinations. And it is on the basis of our choices that our destiny is set. And so when I make choices that are not in a line with the heart of God and the Word of God, it is going to radically negatively impact my life. Now, those three things... represent why Simeon had so much difficulty. Now, his father identifies what is going on with Simeon. Simeon becomes a separated son from his father. Now, you might think this is rather strange, but do you know, listen to what Jacob said about his son Simeon in Genesis 49. Let me not enter their counsel. Let my honor not be connected with their people. God says, Jacob said, I'm distancing myself from this son. Do you know that God does that? Now, you may not hear about it in the standard realm of evangelical Christianity, but the Bible says that God resists certain people. He's no, he stands afar off from certain people. There are things that we can do that can actually cause God to distance himself from us. And then we wonder why our prayers aren't answered. Jacob distances himself because Simeon highly, greatly disappointed his father. And when he did, his father said, I cannot go with that. I cannot walk with that. I cannot agree with that. And so Jacob begins to distance himself from Simeon. This is the last part of the verse. For in their self-will, they hamstrung oxen. Now, so he, he was distanced, separated from his father, but they were also, Simeon was separated from his inheritance. And this is what is so crucial. He lost his inheritance. And here is what Jacob said in Genesis 48. He's talking to Joseph in Egypt. And this is what he says, I'm adopting your two sons. Well, who are those two sons? Ephraim and Manasseh. Those are the two oldest sons of Joseph. I, this is Jacob speaking. I am adopting your two sons who were born to you here in Egypt before I joined you. They now have equal place with Reuben and Simeon. Reuben and Simeon were the two oldest of Jacob who lost their inheritance and somebody else got what they should have had. Reuben should have had what Ephraim got. Simeon could have had what Manasseh got. But they lost it. And Jacob defines why in one hyphenated word. Did you see it? I've already showed it to you. Did you see it? Self-will. Self-will. Pastor Buddy, what's self-will? Self-will is mine rather than his. It's my thinking rather than his. My choice rather than his. My feeling rather than his. My way rather than his. Self-will is a very, very powerful, powerful weapon in the arsenal in the spirit. It is so powerful because it is a self-governing, self-ruling atmosphere. And I want you to think about this. It is so powerful, the enemy saved the weapon of self-will to the very end with Jesus. 
That was the last thing he pulled out of his arsenal before the crucifixion was the temptation of self-will. Not my will, but yours be done. Jesus was wrestling in the garden with the biggest weapon the enemy had, and that was self-will. You say, well, what does self-will do? How do I recognize it? I want to give you some ways that you can recognize self-will. I'm going to give you some indicators of what it looks like, what it does to us. The first one is what I want to call leanness. It produces leanness in us. Leanness literally is a wasting. Oh, I forgot to give you this. I'm going to give you the stone. Oh, you got to have the stone. Every tribe had its own stone. And uh, the stones had to, have three, uh, they had to have three qualifications. They had to be large enough to in- inscribe a name on. They had to be soft enough to be able to inscribe into. And they had to be available in ancient Egypt. This is the stone of Simeon. It's very difficult to see because it's primarily black. It's called black obsidian. Black obsidian is lava glass. And the lava glass is formed when the volcano explodes. And when it does, the lava Lava immediately hits water and it has no and it cools so quickly it has no time to mineralize and become like a stone, so it becomes a glass. It's called lava glass. And it is the stone that you can actually, it's the only stone in the breastplate of the priest that you could actually polish so much to where it has a mirror reflection. It has, it becomes like a mirror. In fact, black obsidian was used as a mirror in ancient times. There is what it looks like when it's polished. Now I want to show you a picture of how it looks when it is reflecting because black obsidian will give you a perfect reflection. If you look into black obsidian, you will see yourself as you really are. This is why God gave Simeon black obsidian. He wanted him to look into his stone so he could actually see what was going on. It is called the stone of the seers because the seers would use it and polish it and look into the stone to be able to see what was coming, what was ahead, and what was in the future. Now, here is a picture of what it looks like. Whoops, too far. Now, what you are seeing there is a person's arm holding a disc of black obsidian, and what it is picking up is the reflection of the fence and the clouds in the sky. Do you see that? It is a circular disc that is so highly polished. If you look into black obsidian, you can see everything without distortion. You can see it clearly. This is why James says the Word of God is like a mirror. When you look into it, you will see your reflection just like you are. You will see what God says you are. You will see what God is saying. And that became the stone of Simeon. But Simeon failed to use his stone. He failed to gain the wisdom from his stone. And so the first indicator is leanness. You know this scripture in Psalm 106. God granted them their requests but sent leanness into their lives. That is a very famous scripture. Here's another uh, a version of that. He gave them what they asked for. Oh, wow. (laughs) You know what that is? Self-will. He also gave them a degenerative degenerative disease. That is the same translation of that. Why? Because what God is trying to show us is that leanness is degenerative. That self-will is a degenerative process. It causes you to waste away. The more I do what I want, the more I choose what the way I'm going to go, the more I, it degenerates my life. I begin to waste away. Now, it's interesting. The word sent that you see there in that scripture has the idea behind it of opening a door. It opens the door for things. Self-will opens the door, in this case, for leanness. It is an open invitation. Now, let me show you what I mean by that. Simeon had six sons. The first five sons of Simeon, all of their names reflect good, God, grace, They're all very powerful, positive names. Now, all of those sons were brought into the generations by daughters of Israel. 
In other words, Simeon was married, maybe one, I don't know how many, but he, there was at least one daughter of Israel that brought these sons into being. Well, after Simeon had five sons, Simeon decided, hey, I think I'm going to do something a little different. I think I'm going to mix things up a little bit. I'm sort of tired of the way it is right now, and uh, I've just been doing it the, the, the covenant way. I think I'm going to try a different way. I think I'm going to do something a little different. So what he does is he goes out and he finds a Canaanite woman. Now, in Exodus and in Genesis, every time Simeon's sons are listed, they are listed, the five sons, their names, and then the sixth son, his name, and always after his name, it says, born of a Canaanite woman. Simeon stepped outside covenant because he wanted to. He chose to do that. It's what he felt like doing. Who cares, right? Right? I'm going to do that. He chose, Now, when he did, his sixth son became, here's his name, Shaul. I'm going to spell it for you. S-H-A-U-L. And it means, well, here's what it means. Do you see the word request in Psalm 106? It is a form of that word. God granted them their Shaul. What they wanted to do, because Shaul means my desire, my demand, what I want to do. Simeon, therefore, did that, and the fruit of that relationship shut down his generations. That was the last son Simeon ever brought into the world. His generations dried up slowly but surely. Now, when Simeon had Shaul, he didn't know that. He, because when leanness is working in us, it is not apparent at the beginning. It takes a while to see it. The wasting away. It is like ALS, a horrifically satanic disease that wastes away little by little. You can watch people. They have all their motor skills. All of a sudden, they start losing little by little their motor skills. Then they start losing this capacity and this capability. And pretty soon, they can't do anything. But at the beginning, you would have never thought that would turn into this. And that's the way it is with leanness. It doesn't look like it, but little by little, it begins to waste away until you have lost the very things that God has intended for you to have. His name was Shaul. And that was the last of his generation. Simeon was the smallest tribe of all the tribes save for Reuben. Isn't that amazing? Wow, here we go with Reuben and Simeon again. The two guys that chose outside the ways of the Lord produced the two smallest tribes. In fact, you could say that Simeon was the shrinking tribe because Simeon started with 59,000 warriors. He ended up with 22,000. Not because of war, not because of famine, not because of disease, not because of natural disaster. He was shrinking and going backwards as a generation and as a tribe. He was not going to last. In fact, when you go to the book of Deuteronomy and you read the blessings of Moses upon the tribes, Simeon Simeon is never mentioned. There's nothing to bless. Wow. It's gone. Wow. Listen to what Jeremiah says. But my people kept doing whatever they wanted. You know what we call that? Self-will. Hey, I, well, yeah, hey, it's not hurting anything. Following their stubborn desires. What are stubborn desires? That's just what I'm very adamant about. That's what I'm holding on to. I have no intention of letting go of that. have no intention of changing. I have no intention of, of hearing anything else. I'm a stubborn. Oh, and look at this. They went backwards instead of forward. That's what was happening to Simeon. Leanness. Now, here's the real problem. Leanness is incurable outside of the grace of God. There's nothing you can do to reverse leanness in your life by doing more of what you want to do. You say, Pastor Buddy, can you prove that from the Scripture? Absolutely. I will be happy to do that for you. 
In Genesis 41, Pharaoh comes to Joseph and says, I've had a dream. It's a weird dream, but I had a dream about fat cows and skinny cows. I had a dream about fat cows and lean cows. And Joseph said, well, tell me your dream. And he said, well, there were a bunch of fat cows. And all of a sudden, there were a bunch of lean cows. And the lean cows ate the fat cows. But when the lean cows ate the fat cows, the lean cows didn't get any fatter. Because when leanness is at work, no matter how much you feed it and try to change it, it will not change. Leanness. Wasting. Leanness is when I'm wasting my future. I'm wasting my life. I'm wasting my potential. I'm wasting the gifting. I'm wasting my inheritance. That's number one. Number two, let me give you this one, blindness. Blindness. You know, it's an interesting thing. Um, That's the only miracle that doesn't occur in the Old Testament. The cure for blindness. Look at the scripture. Now, I love the stories in the Old Testament. Perhaps you'll love this one. This is not really a story that you want to love, but it's a story that you'd need to hear. The Holy Spirit's got it in the Bible. And here it is in Numbers 25. Uh, While the Israelites were camped at Acacia Grove, some of the men defiled themselves by having sexual relations with local Moabite women. Oh, so Simeon, he's He's having uh, relations with a Canaanite woman. These people are having relations with a Moabite woman. Both of those are outside of covenant. I say, well, Pastor Way, that's not fair. It doesn't matter. They're outside covenant. Now, I have enough trust in God to know that anything's outside of covenant, it's not good for me. I don't care what the world says. I don't care what society says. I don't care what the president says. I don't care what anybody says. If God says it's not in covenant, it's not good for me. These women invited them to attend sacrifices because men are so gullible, they will do anything for a pretty face, right? These women invited them to attend sacrifices to the gods, so the Israelites feasted with them, and they worshiped the gods of Moab, which is always the way it is. In this way, Israel joined in the worship of, of Baal Peor, causing the Lord's anger to blaze against his people. And for those people that don't think God ever gets angry anymore, I would have you to read the book of Revelation. I mean, what is this wacky theology where God was angry and now he's not angry anymore? He's this way and then he's this way? No, God never changes. The God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament and vice versa. The Lord issued the following command to Moses. Seize all the ringleaders and execute them before the Lord. Now look at this, in broad daylight. So his fierce angle will turn away from the people of Israel. God wants people to see in broad daylight what happens to other people so they won't do it. Right? All right. So, this, so this is what, that was the command. Okay. So Moses ordered Israel's judges, each of you must put to death the men under your authority who have joined in worshiping Baal of Peor. Just then, one of the Israelites, now this, while this is all going on, one of the Israelite men brought a Midianite woman into his tent. Oh, look at this. Right before the eyes of Moses and all the people as everyone was weeping at the entrance of the tabernacle. Can you believe the gall? I, I, I'm shocked. So when Phineas, the son of Eleazar and the grandson of Aaron, the priest saw this, he jumped up and left the assembly. He took a spear And he rushed after the man into his tent. Phineas thrust the spear all the way through the man's body and into the woman's stomach. Now that would pretty much demonstrate that what they were doing was not a good thing. (laughs) If you can get a man's body and a woman's stomach at the same time, that tells you something. So the plague against the Israelites was stopped, but not before 24,000 people had died. So here's this guy, this Israelite. He's walking into the camp with this Midianite woman. There are 24,000 people dead, laying all around. In broad daylight. And there's Moses and the leaders and the presence of God and the tabernacle and the power of God all around. And he's bringing this Midianite woman into his tent, walking right by them. You say, Pastor Buddy, this guy's an idiot. No, he's not. He's blind. He doesn't see what's going on. You see, this is why people can do things and watch other people destroy themselves and go right along and do it as well. 
You can watch dis- misfortune. You can watch disaster in somebody else, but you never see it. You never identify with it. This man had no, he made no connection between all of this death and what he was. He had no idea that he was going to be dead within five minutes. You say, Pastor Buddy, how could anybody be this blind? I will show you. That's verse 1 through 9. Here's verse 14. The Israelite man killed with the Midianite woman was named Zimri, son of Salu, the leader of a family from the tribe of Simeon. When you are walking in self-will, you cannot see what is happening to you or what is happening around you. You do not process it. You do not take it in. You do not, it doesn't compute. It doesn't matter. All this death around him and he walked right into it and he lost his life. Why? Because that's what self-will does. Do you know those guys, the men of Sodom that were knocking on Lot's door? Well, Strike that, reverse it. They were beating the tar out of his door. They were doing everything they could to get inside that house because those men wanted those two men that had come into his house. They would not take no for an answer. They would not listen to reason. They would not take a substitute. They were beating on that door. They wanted those men. And when those angels came to the door and opened that door as they were pressing their way in, they did not kill them. They struck them with blindness. Because that's what self-will does. You say, Pastor Buddy, how can somebody be so stupid? They're not stupid. They're blind. If if you're blind and you step in a hole, it's because you're blind. I mean, this is serious. This is incredibly serious. Because blindness destroys people. This man lost his life because he could not see what was going on around him. He couldn't process it. Number two, blindness. Well, maybe you like this one. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. Let me, give you the, uh, let me give you the third one real quick. Weakness. Weakness. You know, the tribe of Simeon was known for its vulnerability to attack and weakness. The tribe of Simeon was the, the southernmost tribe. Its southern border was totally exposed to enemy coming in through the south. And it was a, uh, their, their, their land was marked by weakness and imprisonment and captivity. If you take a look at the cities in Simeon, cities like Arad and Hormah, these are places where the children of Israel were put in prison and were imprisoned and taken captive by the enemy. Ziklag was a city in Simeon. That's where David's family was taken into captivity. Simeon is known as a a tribe of, of, of having an atmosphere of captivity. Let me ask you a question. When Joseph sees his 11 brothers or 10 brothers standing before him, and he says, you will go back and you will bring your father and your younger brother to me, but one of you is going to go to prison. Which one did Jake Joseph choose? Simeon. Now, rabbinical tradition tells us that it was Simeon who rose up against Joseph in the field and said, here comes that dreamer. Let's take care of him and we'll see what happens to his dreams. Simeon rose up against Joseph. And the consequence of that was he spent months and months in prison in Egypt. Because he's weak and vulnerable. Because self-will makes us vulnerable to all kinds of unpleasant things. Now... So here's some advice from Jeremiah. I like this. Jeremiah 6.16. This is what the Lord says. Now, if this is what the Lord says, probably we should listen. You know, I, as, as we were on our knees today before the Lord, it just hit me uh, afresh. Wow. I am kneeling 
in the presence of Almighty God. This is what the Lord says. Stop at the crossroads and look around. Hey, that's a good thing to do. When you come to a crossroads, stop. Take a look around. Consider. Before you go that way, before you go that way, stop. Take a look around. Ask for the old godly way and walk in. In other words, it'd probably be a good idea to find out what God has to say. It'd probably be a good idea to find out what is the way of the Lord for me. And walk in that. And here's the promise that goes with it. Travel its path and you will find rest for your souls. Now that sounds like Jesus. If you will go God's way, you will find rest for your souls. You won't have leanness. You won't have blindness. You won't have weakness. You will have rest for your souls. Oh, but look. But you reply, no, that's not the road we want. Nah. I'm going to choose this. I think it's right, so therefore I'm going to do it. It's what I want. Wow. You know, the great thing about Jesus, one of the million great things about Jesus is He came to redeem us from the curse of self-will. We don't have to live this way. This is what's so awesome. And so here's what He does. Jesus does something incredible. Jesus chooses three special disciples that are designed to reverse the curse of self-will. How does he do that? Well, there are three disciples who have a direct association to Simeon. Let me give them to you. You ready? Here we go. Simon the Canaanite. You say, wait a minute, that's not Simeon. No, Simon is a diminutive of Simeon. It is it, virtually the same word. Simon the Canaanite, he represents leanness. How much do you know about Simon the Canaanite? Can anybody in the room name one thing that Simon the Canaanite, who was a disciple of Jesus, ever did or ever said? Not one. The Bible doesn't tell you one thing this man ever did or ever said. I call him the undeveloped disciple, the dark disciple, because you don't know anything about him. He never comes forth. It's almost like he represents leanness. He just doesn't ever come forth. Then there is a second disciple, Judas the son of Simon. Judas the son of Simon, you know him better as Judas Iscariot. Iscariot is a word that means man of carry-off. Carry-off was a place in the land of Simeon. Judas was a Simeonite. Does that surprise you? Self-will? Judas was a Simeonite. So here's what happened. Just as Simeon betrayed Joseph before Joseph ascended to his throne, so does Judas betray Jesus before Jesus ascends to his throne. He represents blindness because how in the world do you spend three and a half years with Jesus and walk away unaffected? How do you spend that much time in the presence of God, the power of God, the love of God, the miracles of God, and come out of that unassailed and unchanged? Blind. He never saw what was happening around him or in him. I call him the deceived disciple because Judas thought he was a disciple. And the third one, Simon Peter. You know what Jesus said to Simon Peter? He said, Simon Peter, Simon, Satan desires to sift you like wheat. What does the enemy do? He plays off weakness. He exploits weakness and vulnerability. Jesus said to Peter, you are vulnerable. But I have prayed for you so that when you are converted, when you turn back to the will of God, because what Simon didn't know was he was getting ready to deny Jesus three times. You could not convince him of that at all. Jesus said, you're going to deny me. No, not me. I'm, not, I'm never going to do that. No, not me. Never. No. He was vulnerable and he didn't know it. 
But then he said, once you are turned back to the will of God, strengthen your brethren. God turned the weakness to strength. Jesus conquered self-will. Here's what Paul says about it. We're closing. He died for all. This is 2 Corinthians 5.15. He died for all so that those who live, that's us, would not continue to live for themselves. Wow. He died for them and was raised from death so that they would live for Him. Free to live for Him. What a tragic story. A son that had so much potential, so much promise, chose to walk in self-will and do it his way, and he lost it all. I think he's in there for a reason, as a warning to us. We pay a great price when we live to ourselves and for ourselves. We can look and identify leanness blindness, weakness, and vulnerability, knowing that it points back to a root somewhere of self-will.